Thank you for joining me. I'm Joanna de la Cruz from the Cornell BRC Imaging Facility. Let's talk about fluorescence microscopy and the ways to optimize image quality. Fluorescence microscopy is one of the most rapidly expanding microscopy techniques that combines the magnifying properties of light microscopy with visualization of fluorescence. One of the reasons why fluorescence microscopy is often used is that it naturally is a very high contrast method compared to bright field microscopy and other contrast enhancing techniques. Another reason why you would use fluorescence is high specificity. Fluorescent probes, labels, or fluorophores can selectively bind to a specific region or functional group on the target molecule and can be attached chemically or biologically and aid in their detection. Fluorescence is a quantitative technique. We can measure the amount of fluorescent signal that we are recording off of a biological sample. High resolution can be achieved with fluorescence. Imaging live cells while recording dynamics with time-lapse imaging is possible with fluorescence. Different features of a sample can be studied by using multiple stains or fluorophores. Fluorescence microscopy is of course not limited to the biological sciences since you can use fluorescence in a broad range of applications. Fluorescence involves the absorption of light of one wavelength and emission at another wavelength. Most fluorescent probes or fluorophores don't just absorb and emit light at discrete wavelengths. They usually absorb and emit a range of wavelengths. So when we think about using fluorophores in imaging, it is useful to think about the entire spectrum of their absorption and emission, while at the same time keeping in mind the maximum wavelength values or peaks of excitation and emission. The process responsible for the fluorescence of fluorescent probes and other fluorophores is illustrated by the simple electronic state or Jablonski diagram. A photon, supplied by an external light source, is absorbed by a fluorophore, creating an excited electronic singlet state. The excited state exists for a finite time, during which it undergoes conformational changes and is also subject to a multitude of possible interactions with its molecular environment. A photon is then emitted, returning the fluorophore to its ground state. Due to energy dissipation during the excited state lifetime, the energy of this photon is lower and therefore of longer wavelength. The emitted photons are the signals that you need to collect as data during your imaging experiment. In fluorescence microscopy, one of the most common questions scientists face is whether wide field or confocal microscopy can answer their research problems. Either one could be a better choice. It all depends on sample, application, the required data, as well as data quality. In a wide field microscope, the entire focal volume is illuminated, but this creates blur from areas out of focus above and below the image plane. When samples are thin and flat, wide field microscopes are preferred as they provide good resolution in the XY plane. An example would be a single layer of cultured cells or a very thin tissue sample. The disadvantage with this type of microscope is limited depth information, so it does not do well with thick specimens or samples that scatter light significantly. A confocal microscope has the excitation source scanning with a focused beam of light across the specimen in a point-by-point -point raster pattern to form a complete image of the focal plane. Point scanning 
coupled to a pinhole spatial filter at the conjugate image plane is an essential feature of the confocal microscope. Together, they combine to remove most out-of-focus light. The background rejection from confocal techniques is helpful for tissue and thick specimens because this allows extremely thin optical sectioning of specimens, enabling structures and intracellular features deep within the specimen to be viewed. The main difference in resolution between wide field and confocal comes not in the XY plane, but along the Z axis. Confocal scanning microscopy is presently the most widely used optical sectioning technique for fluorescence imaging. Optical sectioning acquires images of thin slices of a thick specimen by removing the contribution of out-of-focus light in each image plane. This removal of unwanted light provides greater contrast and permits three-dimensional reconstruction of a sample from images captured at different focal planes. All right, try to answer this question. Which of the following is not an advantage of laser scanning confocal microscopy? Ability to control depth of field. Elimination or reduction of background information away from the focal plane. Signal strength reduced by the requirement for a detector pinhole. Capability to collect serial optical sections from thick specimens. Did you get the right answer? We know that the pinhole is an essential part of a confocal microscope. It provides better resolution in terms of depth, allowing optical sectioning and elimination of background fluorescence. The downside is the loss of signal. There are many characteristics of fluorescent dyes or labels that should be considered when designing an imaging experiment. First of all, you want your fluorescent label to be confined to the molecule or activity that you are interested in. For example, if you want to label actin, you want a fluorescent label that will target only actin. Note that there are a number of fluorescent labels that can also be modified so that they can attach to an antibody or act as a whole cell state. Photostability is an indicator of how well the fluorescent signal is maintained with repeated exposure to illumination light. It would be difficult to work with fluorescent dyes that are not photostable as you can lose your signal in the time that it takes to focus the microscope. This property of a fluorophore is an important factor to consider, especially if you want to perform time-lapse imaging. Choose fluorescent labels that have excitation and emission properties that are compatible with the light source, filter set, or detection system that you are going to use. You also want to choose a fluorophore that will give you bright fluorescence with low non-specific background signal or low noise. A high signal with a low background will give you the greatest contrast between what you are interested in seeing and everything else. And although sometimes inevitable, it can be difficult to work with dyes that are environmentally unstable. Some fluorescent dyes are sensitive to air, light, or temperature, so you'll want to consider these parameters before you get started with your imaging experiments. In fluorescence microscopy, it is often necessary to selectively label sample structures with differently colored fluorophores in order to study interactions. Ideally, you should choose fluorophores that are well separated in terms of their excitation and emission spectra. Imaging a sample labeled with two or more fluorescent dyes that have overlapping excitation and emission spectra usually brings about a common microscopy problem known as crosstalk. In this example, 
exciting Alexafluor 488 with a 488 nanometer laser also excites Alexafluor 532. In the same manner, exciting the latter with a 515 nanometer laser also partially excites Alexafluor 488. Overlapping spectra can give false negatives or positives, or otherwise obscure data. Imaging with these labels muddies the signal and interferes with the accurate measurement of experimental results. Acquiring images by the simultaneous excitation of double or triple labeled samples is a common practice, mainly because of the ease and speed of acquisition. However, bleed through of fluorescent signals from one detector to another is common because of spectral crossover or crosstalk. To overcome this problem, image acquisition can be done sequentially. In this mode, each fluorophore is collected separately so that there is minimal to no risk of obtaining a false positive signal in any other channel. Most standard fluorescence microscopes have filter cubes that contain three basic optical filters. The schematic shows how these filters are used for epifluorescence microscopy, a form of microscopy in which both the excitation and emission light travel through the same microscope objective. The excitation filter, or exciter, is typically a bandpass filter that passes only the wavelengths absorbed by the fluorophore, thus minimizing excitation of other sources of fluorescence. The dichroic beam splitter, or mirror, is placed at a 45 degree angle to efficiently reflect light in the excitation band and to transmit light in the emission band. Finally, an emission or barrier filter allows the desired fluorescence from the sample to reach the detector while blocking unwanted traces of excitation light. Some fluorescence microscopes, in particular confocal microscopes, use prisms or diffraction gratings instead of optical filters. In this setup, fluorescence emitted by a sample is spectrally separated or dispersed spatially into a spectrum and then split up into a series of spectral bands that are directed to one or more detectors. Spectral band and detector settings allow each fluorescence channel to be fine-tuned individually, ensuring the best signal-to-noise ratio for all fluorescence channels and permits illumination at the lowest intensity possible. This figure shows the emission spectra of several Alexa fluor dyes. Which fluorophore combination would give you the least spectral bleed through or crosstalk artifacts during simultaneous acquisition? Alexa fluor 488 and 546, Alexa fluor 488 and 568. Alexa fluor 546 and 594, or Alexa fluor 488 and 647. Under ideal simultaneous acquisition conditions, you should choose fluorophores that have the least amount of spectral overlap, and this is accomplished with a pair of Alexa fluor 488 and 647. One of the main concerns when doing fluorescence imaging is photobleaching. This is a process whereby fluorophores permanently lose their ability to fluoresce effectively, leading to fading of the fluorescent signal. This figure shows a typical example of photobleaching observed in a series of images captured at different time points for a triple stained sample. Fluorescence was simultaneously acquired at two-minute intervals. Note that all three fluorophores have a relatively high intensity at time zero, but the blue and red intensities start to drop rapidly at two minutes and are almost completely gone at eight. 
The green-stained nuclei seem to be more resistant to photobleaching, but their intensity also drops steadily over the course of the time sequence. There are proactive ways to protect fluorescent proteins and dyes from fading and preserve fluorescent signal without sacrificing sample integrity. First, you have to choose the most photostable dyes for your application. Add an anti-fade medium to your fixed samples or a reagent that would enhance live cell imaging. Since light intensity is a key factor in photobleaching, use as minimal an exposure and light power level as possible. Avoid lengthy exposure to wasted light, such as extended periods of time viewing your sample through the oculars while not collecting data. When designing an experiment, consider carefully parameters such as total time of experiment, how frequently imaging is done, the number of fluorescent channels used, and imaging thickness. In addition, using objectives that can transmit light effectively and detectors that are sensitive enough to pick up low signals would be helpful. 